So hi everybody! I'm um, super happy to be um, to be here with you and talk about all these uh, these cool things. Um, before we start, I'm gonna briefly introduce myself. Uh, so I've got a PhD in psychology. I specialize in cognitive development and actually uh, child development and how uh, the brain learns and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I started to work at VTAC actually 10 years ago, working on educational games for kids. And then I joined UB uh, Ubisoft HQ in 2008, uh, where I, among other things, I developed a training session uh, called How Does the Brain Learn to actually talk with the designers and uh, uh, gameplay programmers and see what you know what this knowledge can can be used for um, when we develop games. And I was transferred to Ubisoft Montreal uh, when I worked there on, on, on Rainbow Six. And then I joined LucasArts in 2012, uh, where I started to actually be a UX team of one um, for a few years. And I developed UX practices there until, you know, like there was no LucasArts anymore. And uh, I've been at Epic Games since um, um, a year and a half now, developing UX for the studio. And so this is just a, a, a little story uh, in here. So uh, a little disclaimer uh, first. Yeah, I know this slide was in there before I heard the passing of Leonard Limoy. That actually was uh, actually very saddened by that. Um, uh, Mr. Spot represents you know, like science and rationality. So. Um, and although we know that humans cannot efficiently reason uh, without emotions, so that makes uh, Mr. Spock a very interesting character for neuroscience. So I, I've always been using uh, his character here. Um, oh, anyway, so despite what I say in the title, I'm actually not gonna talk about fun. Uh, I don't even want to get into the debate of what fun is actually. I know it's surprising for a French person to want to avoid a debate, um, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm actually using the concept of game flow, which is easier to define, identify, and hopefully measure, or at least easier to research on. So when I was invited to uh, be the keynote speaker today, thanks for the honor, by the way, it's pretty awesome, I wasn't sure what I should talk about, and uh, then I was told that the theme was communities. And for some reason, it was like, the first thing that came to my mind was like, yeah, it's going to be a UX group therapy. Uh, that's going to be awesome. So I can whine about stuff. Um, so this is what I, I propose to do today. Um, uh, and I thought it would be great to get some feedback from the GER uh, community on uh, the sort of framework I've been developing, kind of not m myself, of course, you know, I've been doing that uh, at Ubisoft, I've been doing, doing that at uh, Epic Games and LucasArts. So uh, not been doing that by myself, but I was for you know, three years now, I've been um, the, the sole UX researcher uh, there. So I was kind of like doing my, my own thing by myself. So I'm super happy now to get some feedback from you guys. Um, and so, yeah, this is coming from Ubisoft Design Academy, um, discussions with user research people, books, best practices, and of course my own experience. Um, but just like, let me explain why I felt I needed a kind of framework or a model to do my job. Um, when I started in the industry, UX was not a thing uh, yet. I wasn't a UX something. The first time I had a UX, uh, UX in my title was at LucasArts. And that's uh, so only about three years ago, and it wasn't even uh, uh, my official title uh, on my contract. I just I kind of said, well, hey guys, I'm UX something now. Um, so anytime I started working on a new team uh, the past years, I felt like it was a bit a uh, groundhog day. Uh, I was facing the same misconceptions about UX again and again. And so here are a few of these uh, misconceptions. So the first misconception is that UX is just uh, common sense or uh, another opinion. And um, yeah, <laughs> so the thing is, it's always very uh, uh, easy to say it's common sense after the facts, uh, of course, um, but actually it's not just another op opinion. I always um, tell the developers that we, uh, we're here to have a scientific voice, or at least like use scientific approach to make a more enlightened uh, opinion. Although my game science is not always as rigorous as I would like, you know, we're not, we're not in a in a science lab per se, so sometimes we have to do quick and dirty things to get things um, uh, moving. Another big misconception about UX is that UX is going to distort the design intentions. Um, so people like would also say uh, that sort of things, or 
U.S. going to hamper uh, their creativity. Um, that's why I keep saying that uh, I I need to know who the target player uh, is going to be and what the experience uh, is intended. Because, of course, I'm not going to do the same UX recommendations uh, for uh, different games. And it's really funny because I get, when I, when I go to um, uh, schools and teach about UX, I very, very often get, uh, get that uh, question. And what about Dark Souls? I'm like, what do you mean, what about it? Uh, Dark Souls is for uh, hardcore players and it's um, uh, the intention is to make them suffer so if the intention is to make them suffer well hell we're gonna make them suffer um, so UX is just here to make sure we uh, we get the intention intended yeah. um, not the misconception is that there's not enough time or not enough money uh, so it's really funny how developers don't say that about QA today uh, clearly shipping a game with bugs is not seen as a good trade-off for more time working on the game but shipping a game with critical UX issues is somehow has less of a problem um, so maybe f because of the first misconception you know like the captain obvious um, thingy um, but actually I'm, I'm always telling them that I Doing some UX is going to make them gain time and money in the end because if the game has better UX, of course, more people are going to play it and going to be happy about it and means more money back uh, in the bank. So um, as a result, uh, UX often stands out of the design loop. So this is what I've been uh, experiencing a lot. So maybe this is not ap um, applicable to your um, to your experience. This is just like my own experience, uh, being like a part um, uh, in the studio. But what I've seen a lot is like you have the designers, uh, the engineers, the artists, that they're um, all like uh, designing, debating, iterating um, based on their um, opinions, and get feelings in a kind of uh, closed loop like that. And from time to time, we get marketing that gives input um, about the market and about the audience. Also, you have like executives sometimes that give business strategy. Um, and it's it's always like keep up on the school circle and you know if you have like a ux something um, um in the studio at some point you're like saying hey guys what about that cool feature you've been working on how about we test something uh, on it you know can can i look at it can can we do something <clears throat> and usually like designers like no go away woman it's not ready that's uh, not beautiful enough um, I don't want you to look at it um, and and we have that some of feelings that if it's not beautiful enough if it's not you know like good enough we don't want to test it because it's not ready and so of course eventually the features get tested but late in the process when changes are very costly not uh, very easy to do time is lacking and so only patches can be done um <clears throat> so Seeing UX as something separate is really uh, sad and, and actually uh, counterintuitive. Um, because to me, UX is essentially at the, in, at the intersection of three disciplines. Uh, you've got, you have, of course, um, the, uh, uh, the game team that defines the experience. So you get designers, engineers, artists. Uh, they're going to tell, you know, these are the game pillars. This is really the experience we want to offer. And this is really important. You have also marketing consumer insights that is going to help understand the audience who we are uh, targeting and who are these people and what they want. And um, you have the UX team uh, that is actually here to offer some practices and give some sci uh, psychology, HEI knowledge and give guidelines and methods and do some user research uh, to help them. But in the end, UX has to be the concern of everyone. It's not just the concern of one team. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but we're just here to help them, uh, to guide them and to, uh, to give this uh, knowledge and to uh, do user research to uh, give answers to their questions. But in the end, it has to be their questions. So I tried various methods uh, to convince people that uh, UX is a powerful tool they can use and that no, uh, there are any of the things uh, they fear. Um, so you know, that's, <laughs> that's not, uh, so, well, not always working very good. So I have a, an, epithen an epiphany. Um, <laughs> I'm actually half joking here because I am totally using Epic Lab uh, every once a month uh, to uh, to uh, uh, turning it into a Lack Club. Um, so sh don't don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> and uh, actually, you know, like the um, the small chat with uh, with Paul that Jennifer was uh, saying earlier uh, it works way better when you have booze. Um, so um, yeah, more seriously, what I did is more uh, refining my communication about UX, what it is, uh, reliable 
tool it can use, what it's not, so debunking this uh, misconception, and then offer them a way to own UX practices uh, with the following uh, model or, or framework. So here it is. I tried to break down the, uh, the practical aspect um, in UX in a way that I could clearly communicate about it and the studio, and also try to measure it more efficiently because, well, we indeed don't have a lot of time nor a lot of uh, resources because the game needs to ship and in the end. So I'm not going to go into the details since I'm pretty sure uh, you guys know what usability and game flow is. Uh, I'm just going to go through the list of these heuristics and sometimes give uh, an anecdotal um, uh, example uh, from Fortnite and, uh, and how we uh, use it. Um, but this is really ha wha you know, what helped me really build um, uh, trust with, uh, with the team and you know, have quick wins and, and, and uh, build UX practices in the studio. So there are many usability heuristics out there. This is really no revolution at all. Uh, merely my attempt to boil it down in a small, comprehensive, and concrete list of the you know the heuristics that I'm actually using the more uh, the more uh, frequently. So signs and feedback, of course, this is uh, really important. Um, give meaningful information about the system. Um, so uh, you know you know all that already. I'm sure. Um, the only thing I'd like to talk here is about, I, I'm doing a little different differentiation between uh, two sort of signs. Um, so there are inviting signs, uh, signs that actually encourage the player to do something. Uh, there's also um, informative signs, signs about a state. And what I tell the designers, it's uh, really important um, that you differentiate these two because the inviting signs actually has to really stand out. They really have to draw attention from the player, whereas the informative signs have to be legible, of course, but should not really be in your face uh, because you should actually draw your attention uh, to the game. Unless you, you uh, get into a critical state, uh, like if you're in a very low health. Uh, so that's just like um, a differentiation that, that I make. Um, what's really, what I find interesting like these days, um, it's what I call the red overload. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious about it. Um, and you know, like usually red is a very good color uh, to draw attention, it's the color of blood, you know, and, and if you know, everything in the background is not red, it draws attention, but the problem is that if too much stuff on the screen is red, it's actually um, less good to draw attention. And this is this is from uh, Unreal Tournament 3. Um, this is what happened when you actually on the red team, so all your HUD is red, and if you're getting hurt, well, you have all that, that, that red uh, halo around you. And actually the important information here is where you've been getting shot from, because if you want to not die, this is what you have to really respond to. Um, and so in that case, it's actually harder, uh, well, that's my theory, it would be harder uh, to, uh, to, to no notice that uh, information. So um, analytics on Gears of War 3 showed that the blue team overall had 5% better win rate than the red team. Uh, the problem is that since we sold Gears, uh, I don't have the data anymore, uh, so uh, I'd like to research more on that in the future. We're starting to uh, gather analytics uh, with a new Unreal Tournament to look into that. But if you have some data on that, I would be super happy to uh, share um, things with you. So I really usually suggest to dedicate red uh, for immediate threats and when taking damage. Uh, I recommend using orange for enemy names or health bars and green for player health. Um, so clarity, um, so you know all about that, you know it's all about the UI, all the information conveyed, um, is it going to be clear enough, is it going to be uh, perceived well um, by the players? So I talk about gestalt laws, the font, the size, color, contrast, uh, everything about that, you know, how the, inf the information is organized, um, what's the hierarchy, the context, and work a lot of, uh, on iconography. So this is really important because you know, perception is subjective. We know that with um, the dress, like recently, was very trendy on on Twitter, um, and like people realize, oh, we don't perceive the same things. Well, hell no, because perception is subjective, um, and so we need to work on that. So, um, so on f in Fortnite, um, it's um, 
uh, action building game with some RPG elements. Uh, and in that game, and among all the things, and like shooting zombies, you gather resources to craft and build stuff. So we have a lot of icons out there. And one of the first things I started to work, in as on work on is the clarity of these icons. Um, so for example, I, I worked on that icon. So uh, I had players playing Fortnite a little bit, and uh, I showed them some icons from the game and see if they were uh, recognizing them and, and able to, s to tell me what it was. Um, so if I show you that icon, what do you think this is? Yeah. Spikes. OK, what about this one? That's a that's trap. Um, so actually, this the the first time they were working on the icons, they were using a very um, just a representation of how the traps actually look in the game. And uh, so that's very early on. Uh, it's it's really that's that's not beautiful. This is where we test with our very very early assets. And uh, the players even after playing an hour were not able to recognize the trap icon here. And so what uh, we did is we changed the icon for something that really does not look at anything that's in the game, but it is a stereotypical uh, representation of a trap. You know, like the icon, the uh, iPhone icon on your telephone. Like Phones don't look like that anymore, but we understand that as stereotype. So we changed it, and people, like all the players, were able to recognize this is the trap icon. And this was a quick win where people were like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. Like, we did that very early on, and we were able to change uh, an icon. So yeah, it's a, it's a small win, but it's a win anyway. So that uh, was pretty cool. Um, form follows function. Uh, to me, it's really, really uh, critical. Um, so we worked very early on on the... Um, um, skill tree for heroes. So in Fortnite, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit complicated. Uh, you actually sometimes need to acquire two skills in order to unlock a third one. Um, but this is pretty difficult to convey simply. So of course, the first thing I asked the designer is like, "Hey, can we do? Uh, can we make it simpler? You know, do we need to have that complex thing?" And of course, the designer said, "No, no, no, no. This is really important for the game, for the depth of the game. We need to have that system." I'm like, "Okay. So now, how are we going to be able to convey that? Uh, because it, it's you know, no one." Uh, would get it. So this is all paper prototype. So we worked very early on on these uh, paper prototypes. Uh, the UI designer uh, would just like design a bunch of, of, of prototypes like that, very uh, low um, um, prototypes, and we were just like testing them and asking people, do they understand and that they need to actually unlock uh, to to you know, like on the horizontal and on the vertical um, to actually get one skills and of course no one would ever get it um, so after a few iterations we ended up with that uh, so when you look at it it still looks a bit uh, complex but actually when players I uh, would have put that in front of players and was asking how do you unlock that uh, they were actually figuring that that out um, and this is before any in sort of implementation and so this is where you actually prove them that you can um, um, gain a lot of time by doing that because this is very easy to do. Uh, paper prototype, you do like r rapid iterative um, uh, evaluation and you redo it until it's getting better and then you implement it and you add size and feedback uh, here. It's, it's static so of course you know there's a lot of information lacking uh, and so it's already uh, a quick win. Consistency, of course, very important. Um, everything must be cons consistent uh, because if it's not, people, users will have to re relearn about a behavior. Um, so this one was uh, pretty interesting. Was kind of a surprise. So in Fortnite, we had a mode uh, when you actually had to. Um, um, to connect a generator to a machine to make the machine work. Um, the problem is that in Fortnite, you know, artists are so super creative. They always want to put awesome stuff that looks awesome. Um, but they had one asset that actually is a bit misleading um, because they had a de decorative asset with electrical sparks. And so this is what happened. So players were trying to actually connect that asset that is just decoration to the machine because it, it looks like there's electricity in there. Anybody? You make a power connector? Uh, try to put it where all these nodes are out of place are beside these uh, transformers. 
were trying hard. The artists were crying uh, when they were actually <laughs> watching that. And so this is when you're like, oh my god, it's, uh, it's actually totally misleading, and we didn't think about that. Uh, so it was actually uh, a moment where, like a wow moment, a aha moment for them to like, okay, it's not just obvious thing, it's, it's not just common sense sometimes. Well, we didn't think that that would be misleading or that would put some friction in the game. Uh, minimum workload, uh, so physical workload, how many buttons do you need to press, or cognitive lo workload about attention memory, working memory. Of course, I'm usually um, talking a lot about the brain and how it works. I make them count their basketball passes and, you know, like, put the, uh, the gorilla, so uh, they're like, oh my god, it's in the gorilla. Um, I like to do that. <laughs> Um, and so this is what they uh, they actually uh, came up with that solution themselves. Um, so again, we also have this is again super early uh, screenshots of the game. Um, you can combine actually uh, weapons to make new weapons. Uh, so we have a lot of crafting uh, in that, and so it's very deep. And and we end up with a system where you have you can have a, a weapon weapon that looks like an assault rifle that actually using ammunition that looks like a shotgun um, uh, shells. So this is completely uh, misleading. This is uh, the form phone's function is not working and you need to actually remember uh, what what uh, ammunition I need because they have to craft it. And actually what they came up with is they used, uh, they put the icon right on the uh, picture of the gun. So whenever you have to craft it, uh, you can just compare the picture. Um, so that was also something I tried to um, to communicate with them whenever there's something, a very good practice. Uh, I'm not sending reports that are just like, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, change this. I also point out when uh, things are, are working well. Because you know, it's, it's, it's hard also to be the party pooper all the time. Um, so yeah. So, all right, I'm going to stop giving an example here just for the sake of time uh, about error prevention and recovery. It's um, um, also very important um, in the game and flexibility, um, making sure that players can customize everything. It's also very important for accessibility, right, Josh? Uh, so um, we, it's also really important to think about that very early on. So these are the seven heuristics I'm using the most. Um, so we can obviously debate about this. Uh, so I do like to debate after all. Um, but that's the easy part. I mean, like, there's a lot of um, knowledge behind this thing. So it's, it's easier to come up with your heuristics for usability. The game flow part is uh, where things are getting a little bit fuzzier and harder to frame and to measure. Um, so again, this is very early in, in my thought process, and I, I'd be very happy to have some uh, feedback from you guys. Um, but before I get to the heuristics, I'm just like, for those of you who are not super familiar with the uh, flow concept, uh, I really like it uh, way better than talking about fun, because again, fun is super hard to define. Um, but um, that that psychologist, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, uh, was actually interested into happiness and how people are, are happier. And he found out that people uh, who were uh, more often in a state of flow were happier than other people. And what flow is, is that optimal experience whereby a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits and to in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. So it's all about putting some effort into something and progressing. And when you have that progression, uh, you're uh, super happy about yourself, just like when you uh, learn uh, the guitar and you're getting better and better. And um, Genova Chen, so the designer behind Flow Flower uh, Journey, it was actually like super interested into, uh, into flow and uh, into how we can translate that into games. And uh, he pointed out that descriptions of flow experience are identical to what players uh, experience when they're immersed in game, losing track of time and external pressure. And so he's the one who came up on you know, what, um, you know, the application of flow uh, in games, and that it, sh it shouldn't be not too easy, not too hard, and also we have to figure out uh, that 
different player is going to have different flow zones. Like a novice player is not going to have the same flow zone that a hardcore player. I'm thinking about the Dark Souls player here. Uh, but the hardcore players will need more challenge and they need to suffer uh, more. So it's actually pretty hard to find, you know, if if you have a game that is targeted to a broad audience, it's it's pretty it's pretty hard to manage that. Um, so I have a slide that is misplaced. That's awesome. Whatever. Um, ooh, I'm gonna do that. Um, there's um, these researchers like Switzer and uh, Wyeth that actually um, came up with a game flow model using uh, the theory from uh, Csikszentmihalyi. So they were looking at the elements of flow, and Csikszentmihalyi himself like had you know eight elements of flow, and some of these elements are actually um, more consequence than uh, a way to get to the flow state, like immersion, like feeling like losing track of time. This is actually a consequence, and um, these researchers are actually trying to um, use the game flow, uh, use the flow model in games, and they translated um, this concept, these elements, um, into like game elements. And if you look at these elements, uh, actually there's a lot. So concentration is all about making sure you can um, um, focus your attention on something that's that really the, the important parts, uh, get, getting feedback on what you do, uh, having control. This actually is more uh, in the usability side. There's already a lot of stuff like that that you uh, find in the usability heuristics. Um, then you get immersion. Again, this is more a consequence uh, than you know what what you do to get to the immersion state. And uh, the uh, interesting part to me was these ones, you know, the challenge part, getting clear goals, um, matching the player skills, and social interaction um, to get to that flow part. And uh, so a lot, a lot of that was um, was actually um, I made me think about the uh, uh, self determination theory. Um, and actually, Scott Rigby is is also using that theory um, to come up with his model. Um, but you know, that's that's how I came up with my heuristics. And this is where I have to go back because I messed up the slides. Uh, and this is like the the first of these heuristics. So I came up with three. Um, so, you know, three is easier to remember, <laughs> and I put a lot in these three buckets. Uh, the first one is the perceived uh, pacings, and I'm going to do that again. Um, so perceived pacing, and the, the important word here is perceived, um, because, of course, you as a developer is not going to perceive the pacing uh, the same way as a, a new player. So it's all about, of course, challenge, never too easy nor too hard. Uh, it's also about pressure. Um, the game should not be uh, too relaxing or too intense for too long. Uh, so of course, if you're targeting children, uh, this might not be uh, completely true. You need less pressure uh, with children. Um, and the learning curve is really important. Like distribute learning um, over time, not like learn everything um, just like through text, but learning by doing through level design. And this, the part of that is actually interesting is how, how you can measure that and how you can give like very early on, because this typically this is something you can measure later in the, in the game development and it's hard to anticipate these things. So this is how we uh, actually, we tried to tackle one of the problems. Um, the Fortnite animation team was wondering, um, we had some problems with aiming with the husks. So the zombies are called husks. And there were a lot of players complaining that they could not uh, aim correctly at the husks. And uh, what they were saying is that it might be because they're too small, they're running too fast. And so the animation team was wondering what really was causing the aiming issues. Um, so to test pr this problem, we actually created a gym level um, to, you know, just like recreate a small part of uh, the Fortnite game to actually uh, control these uh, these elements and see what really was causing the problem. And what we saw is that so we asked the players to um, aim and do as many headshots as they could, and the husk was spawning all the time. And we did that with a, uh, a few players, and we were uh, putting them some pressure, like saying that it's competition, and we were looking at wha what was going on. And what we saw, I'm gonna turn that down a little bit. What we saw is that it actually are able to aim very far away, 
But the big problem is that when the husks are actually going around an obstacle, uh, it's not. So in the end, it was not really uh, the size of the husk, it was not really the uh, animation of the husk, but it was the pathing code uh, whenever the husk have to um, go around an object. Um, so this is how we actually uh, were able to measure one thing um, that is affecting the control the player has uh, over the game and affecting uh, the uh, challenge because it looks too difficult. Um, so it might there might be other problems, but at least we were able to see that the pathing code was a, mo a more important problem than um, other ones. So that was for uh, the pacing. Then the big uh, second bucket is motivation. Of course, we need to be motivated to do things. Um, yeah, we're humans. Um, so the easy part, of course, uh, extrinsic motivation, like uh, clear goals and rewards at the short, medium, and long term. Um, and the most difficult one is getting this intrinsic motivation. And this is where, again, I'm talking about the self-determination theory from uh, DC and Ryan. Uh, and uh, I, what I like about this theory is actually the talk. It, it, it's actually pretty... It's more easy, let's say, uh, to translate that into a uh, game. Uh, so they talk about competence, autonomy, and relatedness. And... Well, when you look at competence, well, there's a lot of stuff that we can relate in games, like so all about the controls of the games, the, s the skills, how the progression is felt. So that's totally relevant. Um, and you look at autonomy, it's all about making sure that the player has meaningful choices, um, not just like, do you want to save the princess, yes or no? Uh, yes, no, if you know, you're sure you don't want to save the princess? Well, I'm really talking about meaningful choices here and self-expression, you know, customization uh, as uh, usually uh, like a very good practice in games. So again, that's a very uh, relevant bullet. And the last one, relatedness, well, of course, like social interaction, like club games and competition games uh, are often really, um, a really good way to motivate people to play. Um, I'm wondering if uh, we can you know, get that connection through NPCs. When you look at, again at Mass Effect 2, when you have that strong connection to your NPC, um, maybe that's, that's also a way to go through, like, through uh, character development. Um, but anyway, so, that's, so the control part is also uh, what we measured wha when, we do, when we did the, uh, the gym level. And so to measure again the motivation and meaning for the player um, in the game, we what we do is we have them play um, a, a bunch of, uh, of the game, and at the end of session we ask them you know questions like, did you clearly feel uh, the impact of your progression in the game? Uh, how about um, what 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 would be the next two or three things you would be doing in the game? and stuff like that, you know, I can express myself meaningfully in the game, uh, the game is more uh, interesting to play with others, you know, that sort of questions. Um, and then later on you can measure with analytics if actually people, you know, in their behavior is matching what they were saying. Um, but of course you cannot really do that if the, um, the game developers did not come up with uh, very clear um, pillars for the game and what is really important for this experience. Um, so that's the reason why it's really super important to have the game developers uh, play that with you and uh, make sure that they're part of the process so they can come up with really what's important and what are their um, uh, burning questions. Um, so that that was um, that was an, uh, an interesting part. But I also what I do when when we do some user research, um, sometimes I would annoy the player all the time by stopping the player when he plays and asking them, okay, so what what did you do so far in the game? Uh, so I'm checking, uh, for example, we would introduce a feature like home base, which is actually you and, and the game. You have that home base and you build uh, buildings uh, to you know level up and and send out heroes and and, and missions. And so the first time the players are going through a home base, I would just stop them and then, okay, what, what did you do so far? Uh, to actually verify if they understood what home base is, if, it, you know, if they understood that it was important. Of course, I don't, I don't uh, expect that they understand everything about home base, about that moment. Of, um, they don't understand ev everything about that specif specific feature we are, we're testing, but I'm just verifying if they got the really important points. And then I'm asking them, what do you think you're going to do next? in the game to see if their expectations is really matching uh, what we uh, want them to, um, to feel. 
The last one is uh, emotion. Uh, so the brain is not rational, it's emotional. Uh, so here comes the booze. Um, but this is actually harder to measure. Um, and this is where we can try to play with biometrics, which I hadn't done all that much so far. Um, but I'd love to play with that sort of things. So game feel, this is uh, really important. You know, how do the controls, the cameras, and the characters feel? Um, actually, at Ubisoft, they, they call that the three Cs, and it's uh, really important um, for the games, like the really uh, how how it feels to play the game. You know, the camera, whether it's it's far away uh, or it's closer to the characters, not not going to feel the same way. So it has to um, be matching the experience you want to offer. Uh, the implicit motivation, so this is more about the drives, uh, you know, uh, survival and reproduction, you know, eros and tanatos, that sort of things. Like we know that as being humans, we like to show off, we like to have the biggest uh, gun or the biggest garden or whatever. Um, so that's really important um, to us as a, um, a motivational drive as well. And the reward system uh, and the brain, you know, like uh, dopamine and that sort of things. Uh, I wrote flow breakers, so usually like uh, anything that's unfair death. So again, I'm not talking about Dark Souls here. Um, losing hardware possessions, all that kind of thing is usually felt as, you know, you, you losing something, you put some effort to get, and usually this is not uh, very good um, for the motivation screen, bad emotions. And meet of ex or exceed expectations, so that is more targeted to um, the marketing team. It's usually like if, if you have an awesome marketing uh, um, uh, event and, and you're just like explaining how the game is, is going to be, it's going to be awesome, you actually like putting expectations very high. And if the game in the end is not meeting these expectations, this is going to create uh, bad emotions. And the last one is offer surprises. So we know that the brain likes uh, to have some surprises, not too big of a surprises, so that's not like to come back. But some surprises here and there is actually uh, really good um, to get good emotions and uh, motivation. So this is it. This is the three um, the three game flow heuristics. Um, so I'm not saying it's perfect. Again, it's just an attempt to boil it down something simple that I can translate to the team and communicate to the team, and we can work together and to trying to accomplish that. And so, um, yeah, I was told by the internet that cats could uh, provoke positive emotional response. Um, so for every little bit uh, that you implement in the game, so I tell, I tell the developers, uh, even if it's placeholder, uh, make sure that is it following the usability guidelines? And also uh, ask yourself, does it make sense for the game flow and for the overall experience uh, that we want to offer, even if it's just like adding an asset of a decoration that is just like electrical spark, but actually it could have an impact on the gameplay, so that's pretty important. And uh, so I tell them, whatever you have an awesome feature you want to put in the game uh, or you know, try to solve a, a, a fixing a problem, always start with uh, why. Why is this going to be really important for the player, for the experience? Um, and then how, how it's going to look like, what's going to be the functionalities of, uh, of that thing you want to, uh, that feature you want to put in. And in the end, what it's going to look like, you know, what's, what form is going to take. Um, so I, I'm taking that from uh, Simon Sinek, is actually uh, the why, how, what uh, is really uh, important as well when you talk about a product uh, to your audience. Um, but it's also super important to always start with the why, why it's important for uh, the experience. And in the end, once, uh, you know, they, they have something to show and to test, I uh, would look into you know, how the, the user is actually um, uh, feeling that feature. Does he actually get the why? Why is it important uh, for him? And this is also the part when I'm telling the developers, you have, you have to think about your questions. Um, because you, we, can, you know, we can get data for pretty much everything, um, but then there's no way we can, uh, we can like, look into the data, uh, do an analysis of everything. Uh, it's just not possible. So ask yourself, why are they really the important questions you have? And we find out, we're going to find out what um, tools we need and uh, what methods we're going to use to find answers to these questions. Questions. So uh, I'm hoping that we are beyond that stage um, today in our industry. Um, and actually, in fact, I've, um, so I played that game. It's uh, called Kung Fu Rabbit. Yeah, I sucked at that game. Uh, <laughs> but I'm starting to see stuff like that. So people really understand now how important it is to um, like 
put yourself in the, um, the shoes of the player and see how they could actually feel and experience the game. So just to sum it up, how to, collabor uh, collaborate, to collaborate with developers. Man, I need a drink. Um, so <laughs> the first point is uh, debunk the uh, UX misconceptions. You know, we're not designing the game for them. We're not giving another opinion because they already have a lot of opinions to deal with. Uh, we're just here to guide the designers to achieve their intentions by using a scientific approach. Um, number two is insist on uh, testing very early on, even with paper prototypes, to actually demonstrate UX quick wins and to gain time uh, and money. Put together a simplified model uh, framework to facilitate communication and allow everyone uh, to own it and be a UX advocate. So I'm not saying that they should do all the testing themselves, but they should own this thing, they should be advocate for UX. They should come to me and say, hey, we had this new feature, can you test it? It should be this, I should be doing this and this and that. This is really important for the experience because this and this and that. And then I'm like, okay, so we can think about how we're gonna uh, test that thing. So it's really important for them to own to own it and be able to talk about it. Uh, and put UX at the center uh, of the studio. So it can be very uh, difficult if, uh, if you're a consultant. So if you're outside of the studio, it, it could be uh, uh, super difficult to do that. Um, but it, it cannot be the responsibility of a separate team only. We're here to guide them, again, to bring the knowledge and the tools, but UX should be the concern of everybody. Uh, so the dev team has the curse of knowledge, but the problem is, so do we. Uh, we know very very well what we're doing, and sometimes when we communicate to them, it's we're talking, you know, gibberish, and they're not necessarily understand what we mean, and we need to put ourselves in their shoes uh, and make sure that we apply UX to our own processes, make sure that uh, our reports are usable and they can actually understand very clearly what's going wrong, uh, and also make sure that we have good flow and uh, that UX is actually motivating and exciting to do and not something like, again, the patty pooper, like, oh, this is bullshit, you have to fix that. Um, so that's, uh, we, have, we have to apply UX to our own UX processes. So uh, this is it. There you go. That's my checklist slash model slash framework, whatever you want to call it. I'm using. Uh, so we're using this vocabulary in our UX reports, uh, in our UX design iterations, uh, iteration cycles. The QA at Epic is also using uh, starting to use this vocabulary to report comments from um, uh, developer playtests. Uh, it's certainly not exhaustive or perfect, and I could use your feedback. So please, um, please tell me that this is bullshit. I need to fix it because uh, this is actually going to help me progress. Uh, it's certainly also not a recipe, uh, but it's been useful to collaborate um, with the different teams and uh, to try to anticipate issues and try to measure them. So this is it. Oh. Thank you very much for your attention. I just want to, before we, we go to the questions, I don't know how much time we have. How am I doing on time? Okay. Okay, so before we go to the questions, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Laura Teeples, that is actually the one who did the, the illustration on the first slide, and also she did the uh, the awesome uh, Super UX logo. Um, that <laughs> so yeah, so questions? You all want a drink, right? <laughs> I can't blame you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, this is funny because you know UX in the game industry is is fairly recent, whereas you know human factors, HEI, all that stuff, you know, has ex been existing for years now in just in industrial design or web design. Um, so yeah, now it's it's getting. I think they're they're it's it's getting way more understood uh, for the game itself. Um, but you know, a, a lot of time they they. 
you know, like med use, for example, is one of stuff that is not tested early enough. Like they're like, we we will see that later. It's not it's not necessarily like fun to work on it, like whatever. Or you know, how, what is the download process to get your your game and all that kind of stuff is uh, actually figured out later. Um, so yeah, this I you completely right this is something we need to tackle because this is part of the user journey this is part of the experience um you know just like loading screens whether you have nothing to do but wait and this is this is terrible this is part of the experience um so yeah totally this is like the next step uh, we need to uh, to work on yeah you've talked a lot about how to begin the process of ux do you, what do you see as sort of the pinnacle of, sort of the high point, sort of the, the pinnacle or the point of best practices in New York? Is there a way you can sum that up, sort of the ideal New York? <laughs> you mean like in an ideal world that doesn't exist? <laughs> um, well, to me, the pinnacle would be that, uh, again, UX is, as understood by everybody and everybody's trying to fight for it. Is it really like a question? Is it what you meant? I'm, I'm really what I is you showed us how it starts. Mm -hmm. What does it look like at the end? Yeah, well, let me get there. <laughs> i get back to you. Um, well, the next step, I mean, I'm sure like some people here uh, are already in these next steps, so they might have a better answer than I do. But uh, to me, that I'm, what I'm excited about is, is trying to integrate all these cool tools, you know, biometrics and all that kind of stuff, you know, to start to think about the whole user journey and uh, have every, everybody on board, e um, including the executives, uh, because they have to be on board as well because if the studio is going one way, uh, US should support that as well. Um, so the ideal world is the next step is, is that, you know, having UX not only centralized and, and understood by the uh, development team, but understood at the studio level. And we will like, tackle the whole user journey and use all the different tools uh, really meaningfully and not just to do all the things. Um, because I don't believe this is necessary. It's, uh, it's more interesting to find the right questions and use the right tools and methodology to answer these questions. Yes? Do you think that UX will eventually be part of conceptual and ga conceptualizing game designs? In many other fields, um, a person conducting ethnographic research will oftentimes look at how an activity is conducted and find out that the protocol that they assumed was there is actually not actually what the users do. I'm just kind of curious if there might be an evolution in the more field work, more observational stuff. Um, so I'm not sure I'm following you. Do you mean like, for, like to me, UX design is a bit, is a bit like that. Uh, well, like going out and uh, going out and actually observing people doing the things that you're modeling in the game and finding out how they actually do. Yeah. Them, right? Okay, at that level, like the meta level. <laughs> Dude, my brain's just exploded right now. Uh, yes, uh, I, I believe uh, Ubisoft is looking into that and that sort of thing. So maybe I should have not have said that. Uh, but yes, you know, like measuring and having analytics and, into the game development itself, uh, UXing the UX thing is is as super interesting to improve those these processes. And so yeah, I, w I would personally be interested into that. But again, you know, we have so much time and so um, you know, like you don't have a lot of resources and not not a lot of time. So you have to prioritize what you want to tackle, and and this is interesting. But a game has to ship, so usually the the game is the the priority. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Celia. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Everybody.